Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, hello, hello. Uh, and welcome to our first Rise Up Coalition webinar. We're so glad to have so many of you here who are interested in learning about our work uh, as a coalition uh, and uh, these series of webinars that we're starting today. We have five webinars over the next five weeks that are going to take place. Uh, first, I just want to share who is the coalition. Some of you may be asking. Uh, and so I want to um, acknowledge our convening partners, uh, Camelback Ventures, Education Leaders of Color, Pahara Institute, Surge Institute, and Unidos US, who have been uh, the partners that uh, we have uh, brought together for the purposes of uh, supporting and engaging uh, their member networks as members of this coalition. Uh, below you see a list of over 30 organizations, school districts, charter networks, uh, and organizations led by folks of color who are coming together uh, in this work uh, to the, address the needs uh, and enable students of color to thrive. My name is Kimberly Smith. I'm the executive director of the League of Innovative Schools at Digital Promise and the host of this webinar today. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the coalition and then invite our uh, panelists to introduce themselves and dive into our topic. So our coalition, uh, the reason why we are here, the bottom line, as we all know, is that the ripple effects of the inequities across our institutions from healthcare to education to housing and beyond are inflicting and continue to inflict um, impacts on our students and families of color. Uh, we are coming together because the system will always default to traditional approaches. Uh, and we believe that we can bring to bear models and programs, tools and practices that are developed um, with the needs of black and brown students at the center and families. And so the time is now, the moment's urgent, uh, and this is uh, the work that we are gonna be leading as a coalition. Next slide. So our goal is to publish what we're calling a national action agenda. This action agenda will reflect uh, the priorities and needs of black, indigenous, Latinx, and students of color. Uh, it will reflect the work that we're doing across the country, whether it's school districts, charter networks, or organizations. Uh, and it's gonna bring to, the, to light policies, models, practices, and programs and tools that celebrate, honor, and, and enable uh, students of color to thrive. Uh, the way that this will take shape is um, over the next couple months, uh, we are working together as a coalition to create the action agenda and we will publish it in June of this, uh, this year in a couple of months and then continue uh, to engage in this work um, as a collective going forward. Uh, the webinar series we're launching today, uh, the first one is the myth of learning loss where students of color are excelling. Uh, we have, as I said, over the next five weeks, a series of webinars. Uh, we invite you to join us uh, as we take a journey through what our leaders across the country are doing to support students of color. And with that, let's dive in to uh, our guests and our topic for today. So the focus for today is on the myth of learning loss and where students of color are excelling. And I'm pleased to have with us today, Dr. Darren Brawley, who's superintendent of Compton Unified School District, uh, Vanessa Rodriguez, who's interim CEO at Citizens of the World Charter Schools, and Lakeisha Young, who's co-founder and CEO of the Oakland Reach. Unfortunately, Veronica Crespin Palmer uh, had a family uh, emergency that she had to attend to, so she will not be with us today. Uh, but these folks will uh, certainly, uh, I know that you have a lot to share with the audience, so looking forward to hearing what you all uh, will share. To get us started, what I would love to do is, um, first of all, just go around and learn a little bit about your respective organizations. So why don't we go ahead and get started with uh, Vanessa. Tell, tell us about Citizens of the World Charter Schools. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Citizens of the World is a network of schools uh, that is focused on really creating uh, a space and, and, and learning experience where students can um, come together across lines of difference uh, and really work together to tackle, tackle big problems that exist in our, our communities. 
and um, specifically holding a lens of justice. Um, and what that means is we have schools in California, Kansas City, and Cincinnati, Ohio. We have seven schools in Los Angeles um, with an eighth charter school opening up this upcoming fall. Uh, we have two in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, an elementary school and a middle school, and then we're launching a new region in Cincinnati where we'll open with a kindergarten and first grade this fall. Our schools are specifically designed to be diverse, both racially and socioeconomically, um, particularly because we believe in uh, ensuring that students have the opportunity to really learn across lines of difference um, and work together to, to really create and understand what it means to be part of an equitable community. Uh, we focus our learning model on integrating rigorous academics, social and emotional learning, and with a focus on difference and inclusion and identity work. So we do a lot of identity work with students and with teachers. And um, for us, we believe it is really important to create broader outcomes for students, that we can't just focus on academic outcomes, but we need to look at the whole student, the whole child, to ensure that we're also assessing how they're growing as individuals, social and emotionally, as well as how they're preparing to lead in, in a really complex world. Um, so that's a little bit about Citizens of the World. I'm, I'm excited to be here in conversation with Darren and Lakeisha, and thank you for having me and inviting me to join this conversation, Kim. Great, thank you. Let's go to Lakeisha, the Oakland Reach. Hey, good afternoon. Excited to be here for this conversation. Um, I'm Lakeisha Young, and I always got to say first, because I do lead a parent group, is that I'm a mama first, and I have three children with my oldest. My firstborn is heading to college. So it's uh, just, it makes the work that we do just that much more important. But prior to COVID, um, you know, we're at Education Advocacy Org. We're black and brown, mamas and grandmamas and daddies and uncles really fighting to change the system of Oakland, right? Um, and Oakland, Oakland schools. Many of our families have been, were born and raised in Oakland. Um, their grandparents were, so they have a long legacy in Oakland, but they also have a long le legacy of miseducation, right? And so our work was really focused on, you know, advocacy issues, but our direct programming was around investing in the parent leadership and leadership development of families and parents to shift the system and really sort of not just educating them on things that may they may be interested in at the site level, but really many of our parents were sort of fighting a fight at the site level, not understanding about the systemic things that needed to be shifted so that the work on the ground and their day-to-day -day work as parents actually, you know, bore fruit. Um, and then, you know, so that's what we've been, and we've had some great, we had a huge um, policy win in 2019 called the Opportunity Ticket, which was grassroots led and really focused on giving preference. You know, a lot of our urban cities are dealing with shifts and um, downsizing and people sort of moving out. And, and for in Oakland, it's mean that there's a lot more schools when there's not a lot as many kids in them. And um, with those shifts that the district is making, quality is key to us. And our big push was to make sure that our families had top choice and pick of, of the schools that they were able to attend if they were impacted by that. And right before COVID hit, we were running a really successful campaign called Literacy for All. Um, and that came, campaign really came from the desires, needs, and frustrations of our families around their kids' reading and literacy. And what we learned as we sort of jumped in to support our families and think about how we were going to kind of like shift the system around it. One key thing that really um, was stark, one is just how important it is to have families at the driver's seat to almost anything that you're doing. So you understand what families need um, and how to move according to that. But a lot of folks were focusing on early literacy, right, which is su super important. But we needed to really push the system to say, we, you have to focus on the whole family and the sustainability on the whole family. We have mamas and grandmamas that cannot read right now. And if the mamas and grandmamas can't read, then how are you actually going to create systemic change around literacy in our communities? Um, anything you put focus to and good focus, you're gonna probably see some results, but how do you have those results 10 and 20 years later? 
you're going to have to uplift that whole family. So I think that's what made that literacy campaign really unique um, and powerful is that it paid attention to the forgotten you know, lineage of, of these babies that we're focusing on. So again, and then you know, we pivoted to the hub and I'm excited to talk about the hub a little bit later on, but um, I think that's a little bit about us. And Oakland is just a great place to live and the weather is great out here right now. Yeah, I heard that you're having sunny weather and somewhere in the, in the 80s today. Is that what's happening now? It is. I don't know, but it it is it is wonderful. I will tell you that. <laughs> Thanks, Lakeisha. I will take uh, it. Looking forward to hearing more. Uh, Darren, tell us a little bit about Compton Unified School District. Yeah, Compton Unified uh, School District is an urban school district in Los Angeles County, one of uh, 80 school districts within Los Angeles County. Uh, we've uh, done a lot. Um, you know, we're heavily focused on uh, STEM education. And despite the pandemic, there have been uh, bright spots in, in what our organization has been able to accomplish for our students. We were one of the first schools in school districts in Los Angeles County to bring students back for in-person uh, learning in small cohorts. We brought them back on October 6, 2020. Our governing board also passed a Black Student Opportunity Resolution to allow our Black students to have access to equitable education during the pandemic, such as uh, other groups we're getting, like English language learners, special education students. After the initial shutdown in March, we took a different approach. In August, when we returned, we required all teachers to report back to work to teach virtually from their classrooms. We provided them with interactive uh, panels, clear touch interactive panel boards to capture and interact with all the students within their classes. And once the okay was given by the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, we phased in small learning cohorts uh, for English language learners, special education, and all students inclusive of our black students that were in need of additional academic support. In the summer of 2020, in collaboration with our partners from Cal State University Dominguez Hills and UC Irvine. We implemented summer bridge programs for our eighth grade students that were transitioning to the ninth grade. We also provided summer STEAM camps for students in grades three through eight, providing them with gaming, scratch coding, and app challenges. Uh, STEAM activities have continued uh, throughout the year, such as the Apple App Challenge, eSports at our middle schools and high schools, uh, Computer Science Expo, Minecraft Challenge, First Lego Robotics virtually this year, and a Scratch Coding Challenge, and also Black History Scratch Coding Challenge, and Engineering Week, and the uh, Boeing Wingspan Project as well. So a lot of things that we've accomplished, uh, some of which we'll talk about a little later. Great, thanks, Darren. So uh, we're going to act like this is a living room, y'all. Uh, and this is going to be a conversation. Uh, we all know each other and are working together in this coalition. Uh, so let's start talking about this um, deficit narrative of learning loss and the affiliation, the way it's been affiliated with students of color um, in the media. Why do you think that has been the front page story for students of color, largely um, in the education sector? Anyone can jump in. Yeah, you know, I, I think that depends on where you're at. You know, there are certainly uh, many areas where this has been a factor based upon the approach taken uh, by various school districts. Um, however, there are areas where this has not been an issue. You know, it's been mitigated due to the approach that school districts uh, selected to take. Those areas that were quick to respond. Um, by implementing in-person schooling and services definitely did a better job addressing the learning needs of students of colors. And uh, I, I, you know, I believe that our school district was one of those you know, in terms of bringing school, uh, students back to school earlier so that we can mitigate the learning loss and you know, addressing the needs of our special education students, our English language learner students, and, and any students, even our, our African-American students that we're in need of additional academic supports. Um, yeah, I would say um, when I think about that question of why was that the narrative, 
I would first start to say that, you know, obviously we were in an education crisis in many of our cities before we entered into a health crisis, right? Um, but, but I also believe that as this sort of evolution around the pandemic is happening, more privileged families were taking the lead on the narrative, right? So when the pandemic pods were happening, that was a huge narrative. And like, I feel like the country was responding to that, you know? Well, if they have pandemic pods, but let's make sure that the black and brown families have pandemic pods. And it was like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Actually, black and brown families, at least in Oakland, are saying they want to keep their kids at home, right? So that's not going to actually work right now. And then when those families decided they want to go back to school, right, then that school reopening conversation got really big. And then it was like, well, let's open up the schools for, we got to open up the schools because, you know, the most underserved kids need to get back in school. And it's like, wait, hold up again. Our families just, they are still saying, right, that they want to keep their kids at home, right? So, you know, I think that the way that the narrative has permeated has a lot to do with who gets heard and listened to when it comes to, you know, and that's why we do so much work with the open reach and with media and pushing and pushing about like, you need to tell the other stories. That's why this webinar is so important is to say, one, we need to be very clear that like, based on personal choice and based on school experience, one out of six of our families in our recent spring survey so we have 42% of our family saying that distance learning is working better for them right now. I know that that is in large part due to the hub that we have built and the opportunities that it has given our families in the hub. But one in six of our families have said that like, they didn't like the school was not, in-person school was not working for their kids prior to the pandemic. So if we are really listening to the families we serve, then we have to make sure that we are responsive to them. And why does that continue to be a challenge? Kim, that is a very, very good question. But I try, we try to take a little bit of time thinking about that and a whole lot of time making sure that we are getting information from our families and screaming from the mountaintops that every family does not feel this way and every family's experience in school was not one in which they wanna go and bring their kids back to school. Parents are more activated, engaged than they've ever been because they've had to figure out over a year how to educate their kids at home. And obviously with models like the hub in Oakland to support them, they're feeling like, wait a minute, I'm more supported. I'm having, our kids have access, my child is actually reading. You know, we have kids reading, going up multiple grade levels in five weeks in virtual learning. And, and what I like about this conversation, even listening to Darren is that, Darren, you remember our call on Friday. It's like, I'm ex we're excited to hear about the ways in which people and which systems and groups are being innovative to serve kids in the best way. The Oakland Reach is not saying you have to be virtual or be in person. We think our hub and our hub model works anyway, but kids and families have to be first and they have to be in the center of the decisions. And I feel like that was the connection that I really made with Darren, you know, when we chatted Friday. And, and one of the, you know, to, to go to one of the points that you made, it's, it's true, there are, are certain students that have excelled in, in the virtual learning model. And there are certain teachers that have excelled. You know, certain teachers that used to have discipline problems in the classroom, no discipline issues anymore, but now they can just truly, truly teach. So we've mm -hmm. seen some very, very bright spots in terms of uh, virtual learning as it, as it pertains to uh, certain groups of individuals, whether they're students, whether they're teachers, whether it's the parent interaction, you name it. That resonates completely for me. One of the things um, that first came to mind with that question was, this isn't new, right? It, it's always that we, you know, oh, the sector has to address how black, brown and indigenous children are behind. And originally when charter schools were launched and I, I, you know, being a part of a charter network, many of the charter schools were thinking, oh, we need to give really rigorous academics and discipline. And it was like, here's the push, right? Because our children for whatever reason need a different approach than what broader society was offering and what white families were offering their children in private or independent schools. And so this narrative was, was not anything new for me. I also think it's pushed by a lot of folks who are in the testing world and want um, to push academic data out in front um, when we know that um, 
for, for decades, a lot of that system has not um, really fully captured what our students bring to the table and what they know and what they're capable of. Um, at, at Citizens, we, we definitely have taken a different approach um, to ensure that we're assessing our students, not just on what they want and need, but what they're experiencing. And right now we're in the process of surveying our middle school students to see what the virtual learning experience has been for them this year and what they've really gained from it. We implemented a new, designed our middle school model to, to really connect and create a space um, for our middle school students to, to lean on one another and learn together. And, and, and we call it roots where they go deep in peer coaching. They do a lot of identity work together. Uh, they explore challenging topics and they debate <laughs> and, and their parents are invited into those conversations. And we've done that all virtually this year. Um, and we have found that our students are flourishing through this process. And so it is a complete opposite of what the narrative is out there in terms of the, our students um, and our parents who have been able to come alongside their students because we're doing different projects and different conversations at different hours of the day because we can virtually, which is creating way more flexibility for working parents who are frontline workers and who have you know, different schedules that originally weren't um, able to engage in the way that they wanted to because of the lack of flexibility often in the school hours. Um, but this, this narrative isn't new and I, I think that all of a sudden there's this conversation about how we need to redesign school. Well, I completely agree with when you, Lakeisha, you said, school wasn't working before for a lot of our kids and no one was stepping back to say, like, we need to redesign or very few people weren't. But as a sector and as a, as a broader sector, we weren't really having the real conversation that the systems and structures around how school was created never, never was thought or created for black, brown and indigenous children. It was a very different um, concept when, when school was first created and it wasn't created for everyone. And so now we, we, we have an opportunity to take what's happened this year and our own experiences in our communities to share and say, let's make it work for everybody. And you know what, it's gonna look different in certain communities and that's okay. And we shouldn't be focusing on testing. We should be going deeper in affirming who people um, who families are and the identity of our children and what they're bringing into the classroom in the different ways that we need to create learning experiences so that they can excel and thrive and feel belonging and feel valued. And, and we all know when we feel valued and affirmed, we keep going, we push, right? I know I do. <laughs> and so we need to create that space for our children. We need to ensure that every learning space and it doesn't have to be in four walls. That's one big learning we have from this past year, um, that whatever we, we provide is really providing that space for everyone to bring their full self into that classroom. Um, and on a personal note, like I, I have a 13-year-old son. I have never seen him flourish so much as he has in this past year. And part of it, I know, and we've talked about it, he's an Afro-Puerto Rican boy. He's 6'2", and he's 13 years old. So he looks like he's 18 and he, you know, and he walks into his classroom. He's always the tallest boy in his classroom. And, you know, and, and he's in a, a pretty diverse environment um, and where he's learning. And he's a straight A student, but there was always an issue around like discipline or that he's, he's you know, there, there's, there's these um, concerns when in reality, he's just a really curious young man. And so this year being virtual where everything was like he could write it or he could express it in a different way or bring it into the conversation in a different way, um, just demonstrated to him and to me just what was really happening in, in that classroom for him. And I am grateful for the opportunity that he's had to really be able to talk that through and, and with me as a parent and his mom. Um, and I think he's grown and learned about how to also engage and challenge some of the, the, the discrimination and, and biases that his teachers have of him, so. Thanks, Vanessa. I appreciate you um, not only sharing your personal story, but you're talking about a narrative that's around affirming and valuing families and students of color. Um, Lakeisha, I'm gonna pass it to you to think about what's the narrative, right, that you would put forth based on the work you're doing at the Oakland Region. You can talk a little bit about your hub 
initiative that you launched? Yeah, I mean, as you know, you know, I, I like to tell a story in this way. You know, March 13th was the last day of school in Oakland um, where, where our kids were in person. And our first COVID response, um, where I think is important to note, was actually a relief fund, right? When we actually went back and really listened to our families, we were definitely here in the, social, the economic strains, right? So we had never launched a relief fund. And so we were like, if folks can't pay the light bill and put food in the refrigerator, like this other stuff gets compromised, right? And so we thought we would raise like $50,000 to like help people with like rent and, and things like that. We ended up raising $400,000, right? And we were able to give out money to a thousand families twice. But while we were running this now relief fund, we were listening to families. I think three things were happening. Right. So one, we're listening to families who are like, I'm just disconnected from my child's teacher. Right. We don't have the infrastructure in our home to, to pivot to this now full remote learning thing. We don't either. We either just have an iPad in the house or we have not great Internet access. I was in national and local conversations where I feel like it was a lot of lamenting about the conditions of black and brown kids. Ooh, it's going to get worse. It is just horrible. Right. And I was like, whoa, okay, got that. And then the third component was because we are an education advocacy org that serves families, a lot of well-meaning people, right, were sending us resources like Khan Academy, anti-racist curriculum, all of this in an environment where there was no infrastructure at the homes to actually even support that, right? So when you put those three things together, one keyword came up, statement was like, no one's coming to save us, right? So if we want things to be better for our kids right now. We better figure it out. But it was also like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is an opportunity because the babies are at home. The babies are at home with their parents. We've been yelling and fighting for five years, pushing the system on quality, never to really see what we've been looking for, right? But our babies have been in that brick and mortar, like right? everybody's stuck. And now that they're at home, are we gonna turn back into the, inward into the systems that we feel like are not serving us and say, do something, do something, are we actually just gonna like practice some self-determination and build the thing that we wanna see happen? And that's literally what the hub came about. The hub is like, how do we show the system what the heck we want for our kids, right? And, um, and, and how do we integrate not just the academic needs and aspirations of families, but the socioeconomic ones? What we were seeing as the open reach is that we were losing families, families that we had close connections to just based on life. People's phones were getting disconnected and cut off. People were having to move and leave. So our families, I just want to be really clear on this, like low-income black and brown families, I will put money on and care about their kids more than anybody, right? But folks do not understand the insurmountable challenges that they are faced with just on life sustainability. If you are not thinking about the full sustainability of the family, you are not appropriately serving our family. But guess who's best to tell you that? The families themselves, right? So that's why we built the hub. We built the hub to be the model to show our system how we wanted our kids educated. It was no more do something, it was now do this, right? And so what I would like to share is I feel like the key, um, what's made the hub, and you know, I always say like, let's not get caught up in terms. We, we coined this thing hub, like before hub was even a popular name. I said, let's not focus on in-person or virtual because the reason why we did it virtually is because our parents wanted to keep their kids at home. What is important for me to talk to you about is like what makes what's underneath the hub special, right? It's really what we've codified directly from the needs of families. I call it the porterhouse steak. That's what we call it. I don't know how many people like steak. There could be some vegans on this thing. So pick, pick, your, pick your, best, your best meal, right? But it was like, wait a minute. What have we actually provided privilege? What have we actually created privilege for our families? We are always activating low-income families to fight for a world they have never actually gotten access to, right? It is a burden that we put on already burdened families. So the hub is about what if we actually put the best in front of you and then let's fight for that. I think that's actually like white privilege, right? You know what you got, you know what you get, and you're constantly pushing for it. Well, we need to give that to black and brown families. So the hub was the porterhouse steak. Our families are bougie, super bougie, okay, because they got a hub that was designed directly around their needs. So the hub was broken into three components, and we launched this summer. Last summer was the beginning. 
our K through two students participated in something that we called the Literacy Liberation Center. Um, you know, no trick that it's focused on literacy. We have been running a literacy campaign. We had gotten the district to unanimous, unanimously approve an MOU to move to the science of reading. We have been educating our parents on the science of reading. But guess what? Now that we've built our own hub, we're just gonna run, we're just going to actually implement those, that curriculum or that, that approach in the hub itself. So that was K through two. Our third through eighth grade students participated in something called the National Summer School Initiative. They were just coming off the ground. They're now called Cadence Learning. We partnered with them for our third through eighth grade students. And then the final center was what we call the Family Sustainability Center. We call it the FSC. And the FSC was really the place. Think of that as the place where the parents come to get both the academic and socioeconomic um, workshops and resources they need. Our goal with the FSC is, what if our families are thriving on the other end of this and not just surviving? How do we make sure our families are not just surviving this pandemic, but coming out on the, on the other side? And those, and then the other key elements that I think are really unique to the way we built our hub is our team of community organizers, some of which are on this, um, representing um, on this webinar. I love them and I'm hugging them because everybody pivoted. Like we pivot as an organization, they move to become family liaisons. And family liaison role is a much more integrated role in the household than a role of a community organizer that is supporting families building relationships but is based on issues, right? And sometimes systems issues. But now you have folks who already have relationships with their families, like helping them set up email or being that educational social worker where you, you having a tough day, you think you're gonna give up on this whole virtual learning thing, but you call Hakeem on the phone and he's listening to you. And he's like, you know what? I got my four kids here too. I got your back. How can I help you? That family liaison role was key. The district at the end of 20, um, the last school year had about a 35% attendance rate. We had an 83% attendance rate in our summer, um, in our summer hub, right? Um, the other component, bringing the socioeconomic part, at the end of the summer, we provided families with stipends. So if you successfully completed the hub, you received the stipend of up to $500, okay? And then last but not least, the technology piece was huge. And because this is digital promise, I hope you get a lot more time to talk about technology because that's my baby. I love talking about technology and I think we've done some amazing things with technology. But the first thing we did was to make sure that every kid had a computer, right? And we made sure that every household that did not have internet access had Wi-Fi um, access. But you can't just drop off technology at folks' homes and be like, great, get your babies to college. We made sure that we had business hours um, tech support, right? And now that we're about a year into this, we are now offering tech trainings and tech skills. Our families are actually hungry to get better at technology when at the beginning, they didn't know how to press with language to push for the Zoom calls. Now they want to like conquer the world around technology. And then last but not least of what I'll say, at least for now around the hub, because um, I do want to talk about how we've taken the hub and now moved it into the system is that in that five weeks, our K through two students, 60% of them went up two or more reading levels on the district-wide assessment and 30% went up three or more reading levels. This was all virtually, this was all within five weeks. And what it became clear to the mamas and the grandmamas and the daddies is that, oh, okay, this is a real thing. We really, our kids really can read. All kids really can read. We got some other shenanigans going on, right? That is getting in the way of making sure our babies can read. But guess what? Now that we've actually built a model and built a hub to, to do this, we are never ever accepting less, right? So that's where I start talking about building that like, bouginess is that it is around like knowing that we can educate our babies in a way that the system like refused to because the interests were so much on what adults it was so you, you know what you learned during the pandemic you learned how much that the, the system was focused on adults and not on kids right that's what you learned a lot um, um during this pandemic and the hub is really around centering this model and centering education around the needs of the families and how does the system adapt to the needs of families, right? And I know, Kim, there are some questions in the Q&A specifically for me. I guess you guys will yeah, get to that gonna, later. We're going to get there. We got a lot of questions. Yeah, we'll get to that later. So I'm going to 
I'm going to pause there and just, first of all, congratulate you on this uh, uh, immensely comprehensive, you know, way that you've um, addressed what's happening in Oakland. Um, I also want to make sure we drop a, a link to the hub page in the chat. Um, so that yeah. people have access to it. I do want to get, we have a lot of questions in the chat. I do want Darren to talk a little bit about he, what he's doing and what the narrative is in Compton Unified. And then I'm going right to these questions, folks, because people are asking questions. And so we're going to go right there. Darren, you want to take a few minutes and talk about your narrative there? I guess in many ways, you could say it's a counter narrative, uh, one that encompasses why we exist as an, an organization, uh, which is to provide student achievement outcomes for all students. Uh, far too many times we get lost in adult issues, which take us further and further away from our core mission. Um, the narrative would focus on what is possible when you put students first. And I'll be talking about some of that as we delve deeper in the remaining questions. A, a well thought out process for staff development of teachers, I, I think was crucial for us, as well as a system of providing supports and interventions for students, which we did and a process that incorporated parents um, made a world of difference. Uh, parent engagement is higher than ever. Student achievement accomplishments uh, were pretty significant. Um, we had a reclassification rate of 18% compared to the county, um, which was much lower. At, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, theirs was about 15% and the state average was, was about 14%. We had 226 sealed by literacy recipients, which is an increase from the 170 that we had the prior year. We had 98 uh, dual immersion students and a, another 55 or so middle school students that achieved the pathway to by literacy award. And in 2020, 95% of our students applied for FAFSA, uh, the free, you know, the free application for federal student aid. That that blows the national average as well as the state average out of the water. Our, our current college acceptance rates uh, as of right now for our four comprehensive high schools, 92%, 93%, 96%, 84%. We have uh, the most uh, students ever taking AP courses, uh, 1,531 of them. And we have almost 2,300, I think it's, it's 2,290 students scheduled to take the AP exam. So doing quite a bit. And we also had 84% passage rate for students that were enrolled in dual en enrollment courses at the college level. So kids are achieving. I mean, for me, the narrative, it's a counter narrative. You know, not all is bad. Great, thank you, Darren. And great to hear. Um students, you know, and, and the results you're seeing at Compton, that's really powerful. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to do a bit, we're going to put some questions to you. Uh, and just if you can speak, you know, in short snippets here and try to keep it um, succinct, so we can get through as many questions as possible. First one up for you, Darren, is can you talk about um, your effective negotiations with the classified teachers union to do what you described, which was bringing teachers back uh, last fall? I wouldn't say that they were effective negotiations, but one thing that we knew is that we control the work. So, you know, everyone was, we went through the no negotiation process to negotiate the impact of COVID and we were not able to reach consensus on issues, but we implement it regardless. So there's this misconception out there that a lot of people leading organizations have that you have to have agreement. One, one thing that I think a lot of people agree upon is if you, you show up to work, you get paid. If you don't show up to work, you ain't getting paid. So there were certain things that we felt were uh, important for our students to be able to achieve and for us to fulfill the core mission of why we exist. And we stuck with those things. Great, thanks, Darren. Uh, Lakeisha, we're going to you next. Um, do you predict those 15% of families will continue to want alternative models beyond COVID? I think more than 15% of families want alternative models. I think most families want alternative models. So the short answer that, to that would be yes. I would, I would add a little data to say that like in the, our district spring survey, 50% um, of families, um, at least for the spring, and they're gonna be doing a fall survey, um, have said that they wanna keep their kids home, right? And so if those families are gonna be staying home, um, then it's about how do we make sure that they can continue to thrive or that they can begin to thrive 
um, based on decisions that they're making that best suits their families? So the short answer would be yes. Great, thank you. Um, jumping to a question around, in spite of the racist history behind high stakes standardized testing, many educators rely on grade level proficiency and growth data points uh, in order to respond to students' needs and support their success. What indicators of student performance are most important to folks on the panel while avoiding the deficit framing around uh, low-income students of color? Let's go to you, Vanessa, first, if you want to. Yeah, I think we have to broaden the definition of what we mean by outcomes for students. I think we need to include uh, a whole um, body of work around social and emotional learning, as well as defining what we mean by um, difference and in inclusion. I think a lot of schools now are using the term DEI, and it's like, let's, let's name that and let's define it. Um, but I, I do believe we need to broaden what we mean by outcomes for students outside of just the academics. I think we need to push on the system to say um, that, you know, let's highlight the, the learning that is happening. Let's highlight the bright spots. Let's highlight schools like Citizens and, and, and Garen's um, district where we're seeing great outcomes and, and open the conversation to broader outcomes by sharing the bright spots and sharing the work that's happening. Um, it, it successfully across uh, our schools because I think that that's that's powerful and data speaks to people in lots of different ways and I think we can use the data in this conversation to push that narrative. That's great. Uh, Lakeisha, how does your organization look at indicators of success and performance? Well yeah I I'm glad you asked that because I actually just want to connect it to what Vanessa is saying is that I think I don't think our parents are adverse to like their kids being assessed right? I think it's information. I think what they want is to make sure their kids are getting the kind of learning um, and quality of learning that allows them to be successful, successful. So as we continue to build the hub, so when we launched the hub in the summer, we actually assessed all of our K-2 students with the district um, reading assessment and then assessed them again. This is why I was able to share the data of the reading levels going up. And as we prepare even for our next summer hub and thinking about the fall, like evaluation is a key part of it. Um, so from our understanding, like our parents love information, right? But they also want action plans. And they also want to know that like, hey, if my child is here and they need to get there, you've got, a, you've got like a mindset, a curriculum, an approach, and we can work together to make that happen. So um, I don't know how, you know, our, we are still figuring out what assessment and indicators we'll be using for the summer. But the part I will add is that it is important for us. We didn't build this hub as like a fun project. We built this hub to prove to ourselves and to everyone that parents can educate their kids and that our kids can learn. Like that's, I think, a big thing, right? Our kids can learn and they are learning and we're using their same assessments, right? But we're actually doing something much different in the ways that we're teaching our kids and the ways that we're uplifting our families to see different results. So I think that's sort of my best answer, which is like, I, we haven't heard much rumblings from our families around that. Our, my chief program officer is on here. He may be like, ooh, yes, they did, but I don't think so. But I think that our families want to know that if my baby is struggling, what are we going to do to get my baby on track, right? Thank you for the information, but what's the action plan? So that would be my response. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Darren, um, how are you looking at this notion of indicators of success? Uh, recognizing, obviously, the standardized tests? Well, I've always been a proponent of multiple measures and growth. And I, I think that is, is the key in terms of uh, most of what we do within our organization. And, 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 what I, and what I've done all the way back to first become an, an administrator. Um, for us, it's, we look at the eight state indicators uh, for California, we have tracking mechanisms built around each of those. And whether we're talking about chronic absenteeism, suspension rates, whatever that might be, suspension is not that critical th this year or since March of last year, but we were always tracking all of that information. You know, how are our, our students progressing in terms of reclassifications? How, how are we performing on state assessments, whether they're ELA or math? So we have, we have tracking systems in place. We host uh, data chats uh, with our site leaders uh, 
monthly where we're looking at the progress towards those indicators. We're providing recommendations in terms of uh, where things could improve. Uh, other administrators are sharing how they've increased their results and people are learning from each other. So I have a very intricate tracking system around the indicators that we're held accountable for by the state of California. And we come back to those on a monthly basis at you know, our elementary schools, middle schools, high schools by cohort groups. That's great, excellent. Um, one more question here, uh, actually two more, and then we'll go back to kind of the general dialogue. Can you talk about a success that you've seen during virtual learning? And you've, you've each mentioned a piece of this you know, when you opened today, um, but pinpoint a specific success you've seen in virtual learning. And as you think about building on that success as schools reopen, um, how would you kind of extend or build on a success you've seen in virtual learning? Who wants to jump in here on that one first? I can name one um, because I, I want to name something different. I've already talked about the academic pieces. I want to talk about another success that I think can be overlooked that goes to the other part of the sustainability. So remember I shared that our, our team pivoted to be family liaisons, right? We have been really trying to figure out how do we keep growing this leadership ladder where our, our parents become leaders who bring in more parents, right? But guess how we made that possible, not even expecting to make that possible, was through the virtual hub, right? So when we actually launched the hub in the summer, we had, we had a team of 11. And I think, I think it was about a team of 11 and then eight, there were about eight to 10 family liaisons. Well, now picture this. I know you guys, okay, picture this. So our family liaison, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an exact example. I'm going to give you Hakeem again. So Hakeem is a family liaison. One of his parents that he supports, who's a power parent, her name's Tony Rochelle. He's been supporting her and as a organizer for a past year. Now we launched the Summer Hub, right? She supported by him as a family liaison, thinks that this is the best thing since sliced bread and says, I want to become a family liaison, right? So when we moved into the fall, we had more students, right? So then we actually hired more family liaisons. So Tony went from being a power parent to actually being on our team, right? So I think the economic development component of this um, has been huge for us from the ways in which we have actually been able to hire our own parents to be family liaisons, bring them on and with income. And then now that we're expanding, the hub within the school system, we just helped the school system hire 30 more people. Some of them are family liaisons, some of them are literacy tutors, which is not just giving jobs to folks, but it's also building expertise in some of our most like detri like our most challenging areas. Now we are becoming the experts, right? So I would say I want to press this, I want to push on the success of like we're starting an economic chain that needs to be recognized as well. Yeah, I love that effect and how that momentum is just taking on a, a pace and, and a space of its own. And the connection to the system is re a really interesting one for us to dig in a little bit. Um, Vanessa, Darren, any virtual success you wanna pinpoint and think about how it can grow as we move forward? Go ahead, Vanessa. Yeah, I think one of the things we did that we created um, and implemented last, throughout the year last, we started last summer, last spring, we created it when, when we closed. We also closed on March 13th. Um, and we created a navigating change series for our educators. Um, and we implemented it completely virtually through the year with, with educators, but simultaneously we created what we call the lab. And the lab was for teachers then to come together virtually to plan cross regions. So we were able to really maximize our talent, not just in Los Angeles, but we were able to pull from the best of Kansas City as well. And they came together to plan and take what they experienced through the Navigating Change series, which was like really talking about trauma, loss, pain, healing, um, and create lessons for the school for this past school year for students so that the students could engage. And because they themselves experienced it, they were able to really build a robust experience, learning experience virtually for our students. 
who then were able to talk about their experience working from home, some of the loss that they've experienced through this pandemic. And also there were real conversations around the injustices that everyone was observing, but for many of our students we're living and experiencing every day. And I found that to be one of the most powerful um, things that we did this year and that we created that space. And now we're, we're taking those modules so that we can continue to come back to them and build off of them for future support of teachers, but also to implement in classrooms where we don't have to do it in person. We know we can do it virtually and that's, that will lead to our students building on their social and emotional um, growth, as well as being able to then translate that into the work that they're doing academically. For me, it, it, it really focuses on the way that we intervene and support our students. Um, we launched a massive uh, tutoring uh, piece, online tutoring piece through paper this year. That's the name of the company. We also uh, intervene differently with our college tutors, uh, having them work virtually and hiring a, a lot more of them to support our students. Also, uh, the teachers. Uh, teachers uh, started supporting students in a different model virtually. Um, instead of you know, the, the old model of after school tutoring, now we have teachers logging in at five o'clock or seven o'clock to support people, you know, once they got home, they were logging in to support the, the, the students and provide the enrichment that they needed. So it, it gave us a different model of intervening and intervening on a much broader scale to support the, the needs of our students. So that, that's one thing that really, really stood out. That's excellent, thank you. Um, as we are winding down here, I want to give each of you an opportunity to, um, if you think there's policymakers in our audience, funders, right, folks that, um, that we want to hear our message, um, and, and all of you being part of this coalition, um, from where you sit and your perspective, what kind of message do you want to share to um, to really bring to bear the resources that you need and that we need to do this work effectively to support our students. So um, just any, any kind of thoughts you would share just with the broader sector around um, what resources and, and what we need to bring to the table for this work. I would share two things. One, that there's a lot of conversation around redesigning and redesigning, I, so Lakeisha said this perfectly earlier, needs to happen in partnership with families and students. Um, and so any type of redesigning can't go and be done at the leadership level. It needs to include the community. It needs to include our students and families. Uh, second, uh, I think we need as a sector to really broaden um, what we mean by assessments and, and we need to have broader outcomes as a part of that um, portfolio. Uh, it can't just be academic outcomes and testing. We need to put um, financial resources and support behind creating uh, assessments that are much broader um, in all of our schools. And there are a lot of schools that, are, that talk about social and emotional learning, talk about DEI, how do you know that they're making progress? How do you know that they're meeting the needs of the community in which they're serving? And we won't know unless we really truly create assessments that allow us to, to know that and to experience that. Um, we've spent an, a, a good part of this year also doing empathy interviews with our community, with our families and with our students, our middle school students in particular to really understand here, what are their needs? What do they want? And then we're designing to meet that as well as to ensure that we're providing a really challenging and rigorous learning environment that is joyful. And that's what we believe it should be. And that's what I would encourage our funders as well as our policymakers to consider in their planning. Mine, mine would, will be brief, just two points that I'll make. and. The first is that the school day is drastically different. It's no longer 7.30 to 2.30. And in order to meet the needs of our students, there's gonna have to be additional support that is provided financially 
uh, you know, additional financial support will be needed to meet the needs of the students throughout the day and evening. Great, great point. Thank you, Darren. And Lakeisha, what would you like to share with our audience? Yeah, it's a whole lot of money coming in, isn't it? A whole <laughs> lot of money. That's right. Um, and so, and I say this, you know, I, I'm people know me, I'm I'm trying to be funny, but <laughs> this is serious. Yeah. The 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 point I'm trying to make is this when we have had a lot of districts um, operate from what I call a deficit mindset. Um, I believe we were in the most sunken place before COVID hit. It was a hustle for bodies, district and charter. And there were little to no conversations about how our kids are gonna get educated and be on the pipeline to um, college. I don't believe that money changes mindsets necessarily, right? So bringing in a lot of money into systems that have not actually done like what Darren has done without the money is, um, is risky at best, okay? And so I think what we are talking a lot about is how do models like the hub continue to scale and grow? As you know, we have this lawsuit against the state of California um, right now um, that we are pushing forward in terms of like just holding them accountable for how they have not been serving our kids. Um, so what we really wanna see is how a parent-centered and led thing like the hub continues to get replicated and grow um, because it really is a quality model that truly puts the needs and aspirations of families in the center. Um, how can some of these American Rescue Plan dollars really go to scale that work in partnership with the, with, with the districts? Because like I said before, our school, we are expanding our hub. We still run our hub externally, but we've actually expanded it inside of the Oakland Unified School District um, and we want to keep doing that work and we want to leverage the money that's coming in to, to do it well, right? Because there's going to be a reckoning with this money, right? So there's going to be a reckoning with this money. Some five, 10 years, people are going to want to understand can kids read better with this money. So I think that it's really changing the narrative. And I think we've got the right kind of model to really, to really support, you know, our district and districts around the country who really want to who really want to think about doing this work with parents in the lead. Great, thank you very much. And this is what the coalition is about, focusing on districts and charters and organizations led by folks of color that are creating, supporting students, um, such as Vanessa, Darren, and Lakeisha. Um, Lakeisha, maybe you can drop uh, to me and I can share with folks how to find out more about how they can connect with you um, they're, if they're interested in having the hub um, as part of their work in their communities and with their districts. Um, I wanna thank you, Vanessa, Darren, and Lakeisha for being our uh, pioneers, if you will, around the Rise Up Coalition webinar series. I uh, really appreciate you uh, personally and professionally in the work that you're leading. Uh, folks, next week, same time, uh, Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have cultural and social emotional learning centering the identities of students of color. Uh, please come back and uh, our colleague Lizzie Choi at the Pahara Institute will be your facilitator for that conversation. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. This will be recorded. We will share the recording out if you registered um, and we look forward to seeing you and please support the work that we're leading. Thank you and have a good day. Take care.